So um, I'm Alex Hawkins from Vanderbilt uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about resisting the Hartman's temptation for perforated diverticulitis and offer some clinical and technical pearls. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, I will talk a little bit about MIS in this talk, but the focus is mainly going to be on um, uh, kind of management of, um, uh, of what you, you've done after you've resected the signaling colon for diverticulitis. So outline, I'm going to talk really about three things. I'm going to talk about what is the problem and introduce the clinical entity that, that is the issue that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the data that we have to guide us. And, and truth be told, there's actually some decent randomized controlled trials out there to help guide our clinical decision making. And then I'm going to offer some of my own tips, tricks, and pearls um, to go forward uh, that you all can take back in your management of perforated diverticulitis. So to start, here's the problem. All right, I'm sure we've all gotten, anybody who takes some sort of general surgery call has gotten some sort of page. 52-year-old male, uh, suffering from obesity, tobacco abuse, diabetes, here with diverticulitis and free air. You turn on your computer, you look at the scan, and this is the real deal. All right, so we're going to talk about management of these folks. Um, I did have a couple of slides talking about how you end up in the OR, but in the focus, or in, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk and jump straight to the OR. So you've decided you've taken the patient to the operating room um, for perforated diverticulitis, and you're really faced with these two options. I am not going to talk about lap lavage today. That's, um, that's a whole other kettle of fish that I'm not going to get into. I'm going to talk about what you've done when you're in the operating room surgically for perforated diverticulitis. And your two choices are these. One is a Hartman's procedure, where you resect the sigmoid colon and then bring out the descending colon as an end colostomy. The second is a primary anastomosis, where instead you uh, create a uh, colorectal anastomosis um, with or without a diverting loop ileostomy. So, you know, this is kind of what I talk with my residents about a lot. Hartman's procedure for acute diverticulitis is safe, all right? You will never... Um, be uh, critiqued, uh, or, or, or it's never the wrong answer to do a Hartman's, but there potentially could be a better answer, because doing a Hartman's procedure requires a number of things after the fact. One, you have to have another surgery to restore bowel continuity, and it's a hard surgery too. I think colostomy takedowns for patients who've had a Hartman's for diverticulitis are some of the toughest surgeries that, that I do. Um, you have high anastomotic leak rates when you do that, surgical site infections, mortality. You have a higher chance of a permanent colostomy. I think Pat mentioned this a little bit in her cancer talk. Uh, 30 to 70% will never be reversed and live their life with an end colostomy. Uh, and we've also seen increased permanence with age. So <clears throat> we all like data. We all like evidence, practicing evidence-based medicine. So what data do we have to guide us? Well, first, you're starting off as is the case in the literature, you look, there's a lot of single center retrospective. Uh, it's safe to do single stage primary anastomosis for perforated diverticulitis papers out there. Um, two more recent systematic reviews and meta-analyses of these papers arrive at it's similar but a little bit nuanced conclusions. So this one by Schmidt in 2018 found that similar rates of complications between Hartman's and primary anastomosis similar mortality between Hartman's and anastomosis, and higher rates of restoring bowel continuity with primary anastomosis. So similar mortality, similar morbidity, but more ostomies get reversed uh, with the primary anastomosis. Uh, Soroki uh, also found decreased mortality in the primary anastomosis group. So actually you have decreased mortality. Postoperative length of stay was shorter in a group in the primary anastomosis and decreased postoperative complications in the anastomosis group. Again, I, I want to be very clear, these are systematic reviews and meta-analyses of single-center retrospective data. So really not the gold standard of what we would look for in practicing evidence-based medicine. So we do have some randomized controlled trials. This is out of Annals in 2012. This was a randomized controlled trial of 62 patients. So Hinchy three to four. So again, perforated diverticulitis, peritonitis, feculent peritonitis, who were then randomized to either a primary anastomosis or a Hartman's procedure. Now, take note of this. All of these primary anastomoses were performed with a diverting loop ileostomy. 
part. So what they found was that overall complications were comparable. They found decreased serious complications, OR time, hospital stay, and cost in the primary anastomosis group. And that OR time is interesting because you it's almost paradoxical. You think it's, it's longer to do a Hartman's, but they actually found decreased operative time um, with the primary anastomosis group. And then they found uh, improved ostomy reversal with the primary anastomosis diverting gluteoleostomy rates in the 90s versus Hartman's reversals in you know, somewhere in the 50s. They also found, too, that in an analysis of when you do the reversal, um, significant events were much higher in the Hartman's than in the primary anastomosis, 20% versus zero. Um, also notable about this paper, it did have low accrual and missed its target. So uh, then we come to diver Diverti, uh, which was published um, more recently in JAX. And this was a study of 102 patients, randomized controlled trial. Um, they found comparable mortality and morbidity in both. And then at 18 month follow-up, they found much higher rates of stoma reversal in their Luke ileostomy group than they did in their Hartman's groups. So as we start to kind of pull themes from these two randomized controlled trials, similar mortality, similar morbidity, and improved ostomy free rates, um, it, you know, pick your endpoint, 12, 18 months. So with that in mind, I'm going to start to move to talk a little bit about some tips, tricks, and pearls for y'all to take back with you when you do these cases. Because this is, this is the rub, all right? We can do it. You know, we went to Sages, we heard this talk, we read some studies, you can do primary anastomosis. All right, here's the reality. How many of y'all have done a case between like 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. over the past year? The OR is a lonely place at 2 in the morning. You kind of look across at your, your bleary-eyed three resident. Uh, your scrub tech is an ortho scrub tech who has never seen an EEA stapler before. Uh, the circulator is tired and just wants to go home. So it's really hard. We want to be avant-garde. We want to you know, follow the data and do the right thing for our patients. But we also want to have good outcomes. And we also, you know, in the middle of the night, just want to get the case done and move forward and everything like that. So let's talk about how to do both of those things. Be avant-garde, yet preserve good outcomes for our patients and do the right thing. All right, some things to think about. And again, this kind of Gary Larson cartoon is, you don't want to get out of the frying pan and into the fire here, all right? So you need to think about the quality of three different things when you're assessing whether to put somebody back together again. First is the quality of the abdomen, and that's the degree of contamination. Has the bowel been sitting in stool for 72 hours uh, after, you know, in Middle Tennessee, they present to Kentucky, they get worked up, the ambulance takes a while, they finally show up in our emergency department, they need another CT scan, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's been a long time since they've actually perforated and you've had the bowel sit in stool for 72 hours. To the quality of bowel, can you find soft bowel proximally? Can you find soft bowel distally to where you feel comfortable making a good connection? Then there's the quality of the patient. What's their nutritional status? You know, do, are they diabetic? Are they on steroids? Do they have a history of tobacco abuse? Uh, and then finally, you know, do you need to perform a DLI? And in, in my mind, um, you know, a lot of times you can get a primary anastomosis that your just spider senses are going off. Uh, this doesn't really look that good. That's a great time to do a diverting gluteoleostomy. This is a patient who maybe hasn't eaten in a week. Great time to do a diverting gluteoleostomy. Um, if you're ever in doubt, you know, again, I think if you're even starting to think about it, I encourage my residents to do a diverting gluteoleostomy. Okay, so how can we resist the Hartmans? Again, two o'clock in the morning, you're tired, you just want to get this done, you've got a full day of cases the next day. So, you know, this is just simple behavioral change. The first thing is agree on this as a team. So either your colorectal group, your general surgery call partners, your acute care trauma service, have a journal club where you kind of talk about the randomized controlled trials, talk about what it would take to start doing primary anastomoses in the middle of the night. Then come up with a plan about how you're gonna do it. Um, in, in studies on behavioral changes, you are five times more likely to make that change if you tell somebody and to do it as a team than if you try and do it on your own. Start with a plan, or how's it gonna get done? Can we, make, can we put together a cart or just some sort of collection of things that has an EEA stapler? a rigid sigmoidoscope, 
things that you need to do a solid primary anastomosis at two in the morning that's in the cart, you just bring the cart in and everything's there. Um, much like our trauma service has a, a bunch of different carts for different um, uh, trauma issues, have a perforated diverticulitis cart that you can use at two in the morning. And then also check in with each other, have kind of a quarterly review. How many patients have you done? Have they gone well? Have they not gone well? What you can do better. Again, doing this as a team will be much more impactful than just trying to do it by yourself. And also just saying, you're gonna do it. Just by saying, I'm gonna start doing primary anastomoses. There are certainly patients that, that it's not appropriate in, but just the simple act of saying that you're gonna start to do it usually means that you will start to do it. Um, I just wanna put a, a little bit of, of this out here. So when you do your primary anastomosis, the one thing you need to make sure of is you get all the way down onto the rectum. If you do the splaying of the tinea, the loss of epiploic fat, um, if you've got a flex sig and can look, um, there's no diverticula, you're right above the, the most proximal um, uh, fold of, uh, of Halston. Um, we know that doing a colosigmoid anastomosis versus a colorectal anastomosis has four times the risk of diverticulitis recurrence. So this is just another thing when you're in the operating room to get all the way down on the rectum. Um, finally, I know this is an MIS session, so I wanted to put together some slides. Um, essentially, there's not a lot of great data out there in terms of um, MIS versus open. I think it really, what it really does say is it supports either one that you're comfortable in. This biggest study out of NISQIP showed decreased, over here on table six, decreased respiratory complications with no other significant findings uh, for a group comparing lap to open emergency diverticulitis cases. So do what you're comfortable with. If you are gonna approach this laparoscopic, and I fully encourage you to do so, um, think about access. I really would recommend some sort of access at Palmer's Point, either a varus needle or a OptiView. This will keep you out of trouble in the pelvis, um, around the umbilicus, and all that area. Uh, think of it by starting it as just a diagnostic lap. Just gonna take a look laparoscopic. That's all you're gonna do. Then go as far as you can. And Pat was talking about this. Everything that you can do laparoscopically or minimally invasive will make that incision smaller and should make outcomes better for your patient. Uh, give yourself a hand. If you normally do your elective cases with a hand port, put a hand port in. I'd recommend doing it as a vertical lower midline rather than a thin steel because that gives you the option to increase your incision if you need to. Suction irrigator is really your best friend in this. So copious amounts of fluid to irrigate all the badness. And then really take your time with the ureters. Um, you know, going back, it's, it's tough to find a urologist to come and place stents at two o'clock in the morning. So make sure you visualize that left ureter, uh, however it takes, even if it takes putting a hand in or opening up. So uh, conclusions from my talk today. Uh, perforated diverticulitis is a challenging disease process. I think the data really strongly supports that a primary anastomosis, when, with and without a diverting loop ileostomy can be performed with equivalent morbidity and mortality and improved reversal rates. Uh, I'll, I'll fully acknowledge that change isn't easy. I don't like change. Uh, but the best way to deal with change is to come up with a plan, invest the folks around you, and then stick with it. Um, and then finally, MIS is, is safe with at least equivalent outcomes. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions.